Hi everybody, welcome to the latest episode of NHM Live, coming to you live from the Natural History Museum here in London. You can find us on all the main social media channels, so if you don't already, make sure to follow and subscribe us. Today's show is live, so send in your questions, send us your comments, tell us where you're viewing from, and we'll try and answer as many questions as we can during the show today. Now we've got an action-packed show, lots of things to get through today. A bit later on, we're going to be finding about, out about the latest visitor to London who has taken up residence in the River Thames, just outside London, a beluga whale. We're also going to be going behind the scenes, looking at some of our collections that are normally tucked away. And we've got a mystery specimen that we're going to be showing you guys, and we want you guys to tell us what you think it might be. But before we do all that, it's spider season in the UK. This is the time of year when arachnophobes are at their wits end as spiders, which have been gorging themselves on food in the summer, start to come indoors uh, and settle down with us. But do we have very much to fear from these eight-legged housemates? Well, let's find out a little bit more. So here at the Natural History Museum, we have one of the largest and most comprehensive collection of spiders and other arachnid species. Uh, so this can be from the biggest tarantula right down to the smallest itty bittiest house spider you see running across your living room floor. All spiders around the world are venomous, uh, however here in the UK we only have one uh, really venomous spider and that would be the false widow spider. And it's about this time in autumn when we start getting reports in the museum uh, about these spiders and sightings and what, you know, what do we have to fear from these uh, spiders. which. When you look at the media, you'll see media sort of intensifies about these spiders, like, oh, they're going to come in your house and come and bite you. And the reality is spiders actually don't care about humans. They'd actually really rather stay away from us, sit in the corner or in a tunnel and just wait and eat flies that come by. They couldn't care less uh, about humans as such. Now, they are common in England. Um, they've actually been here for over 150 years, uh, coming over on banana shipments from the Canary Islands or Madeira. The venom that the Vosbido has is no worse than a bee's sting. So if, you, if you're bitten by one, you're going to feel it, but you're not going to sort of die or anything from that. It's not powerful enough to do that, but it's just strong enough to give you a nasty nip. Uh, and again, it's the name False Widow, you connect that, people connect that to the Black Widow Spider, which we know is very dangerous, that can, has, has the potential to kill. Um, and then you put the name False Widow and Black Widow together, you think they're of the same family, which they're not. And in reality, all spiders, especially the False Widow Spider, just don't want to bother with us. They'd rather just live a life of peace and solitude and make other little baby spiders. Oh, some great specimens there if you like spiders and uh, Ben joins me now on the sofa. Thanks very much Ben for coming along today and uh, for telling us about those spiders there. <laughs> so you're obviously a bit of a, a spider fan. Uh, do you spend a lot of time around them in the museum? Uh, yeah, um, I uh, work up in the collections and I uh, digitise the uh, spider egg sacs and uh, silks collection for use in the uh, sort of wider scientific community uh, and also help out sort of other chores sort of like topping up alcohol and just making sure the, con the specimens are kept in good condition. So you spend a bit of time in the collections there mm -hmm. looking after those specimens, but you also spend a lot of time, in fact most of your time, out in the galleries with our visitors, is that right? Yeah, I am a visitor assistant here in a museum, so uh, one of my sort of primary duties is to sort of welcome the visitors in the museum, help them get to a gallery, answer a few questions, uh, the most important one being where are the toilets, uh, I call them a collection unto their own, uh, and we are <laughs> the guardians of that as, <laughs> uh, as such and help people out. Well, that. it's very important to know where the toilets are. <laughs> it when really you go is. To the museum. <laughs> uh, now, you were talking in the, the video about uh, false widow spiders in particular, which often make the headlines. And one of the reasons we wanted to talk about it today was there's been some stories in the press recently about some schools in London that have actually been shut down because of this infestation, they're saying, of false widow spiders. And understandably, a lot of people, especially parents, are really upset about this. Uh, you know, is it appropriate for a school to shut down? for an infestation of these sorts of spiders. And you were saying that really they're not as bad as they're made out to be. I mean, the press will say one thing, but the reality is a bit different. Uh, what, what, do you th what do you make of this decision the school's made to close? So um, 
One of the things that strikes me is that this is the first time I've seen in recent memory where schools have reacted so um, so negatively against um, these kind of spiders. Uh, as I mentioned before, they've been in the country for 150 years. And I think where we've seen a rise in sort of like fake news stories and sort of world publications, people aren't looking for the right information source, uh, sort of learning more about, okay, what can they actually do? And so um, where, where they're not learning about this, it can lead to very poor and uninformed decisions, which uh, in some cases, it, you don't actually need to close down a school at all, just a, a, an awareness of what is actually going on and an awareness of these spiders. So the venom of the false widow is not something uh, that we need to be particularly worried about. I think you compared it to a bit like a, a bee sting, yeah. something like that. Um, but some people are allergic to bee stings and things like that. Are, th are they people that would need to be particularly wary around the spiders, or is it a completely different sort of venom when yeah. you don't need to worry about it? So, th yeah, for, for definite. Um, again, anybody who does suffer sort of more acute um, reactions to any um, a sort of insect bite or sting um, should obviously be very wary of being bitten by a false widow spider. Uh, that said, so the sort of the age groups you're looking at that are more vulnerable are very young children and sort of the much more elderly. And what the one thing I always like pointing out is uh, it's pr previous medical conditions. Again, like you said, you could be allergic to a bee sting, but you might have other medical conditions that could be aggravated by that sti um, by the bite of the false widow. Mm -hmm. uh, again, to like myself, yourself, uh, pending that you don't have any al allergies it would hurt, but we wouldn't need to go to A&E ASAP. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. You'll be pleased to hear. We've had uh, lots of people commenting on Periscope uh, saying that they have false widows uh, living in and around their homes and uh, most of them are happy to leave them be. So oh, great. Uh, that's really refreshing, yeah. shows that the, some of the press is not uh, affecting people too, too badly. Um, now, of course, in some parts of the world, there are spiders that have reputations that some would say are, are quite deserved. And you've brought along a couple of them today um, that you've got uh, in these jars. I must say, if I was this close to them and they were moving around, I'd be a little bit nervous. Uh, <laughs> can you tell us what ones you've brought here? Yeah, so uh, with me today, I've brought the uh, Brazilian Wandering Spider and the Sydney, uh, Sydney Funnel Web Spider. Um, so the Brazilian Wandering Spider does um, have the reputation for being the most venomous spider on the planet. Um, and again, this ve its venom can kill, it, uh, it is possible to do so. Um, but the important thing to realize is that if you're bitten by this, it's not, you're not dead like that instantaneous. It will take about an hour or more for that to actually kick in. And uh, sort of a similar thing with the Sydney Funnel Web, it's about 15 minutes. But the over overarching importance is that the countries that these animals come from, uh, particularly Australia, um, which is really interesting is that from a young age, children are brought up to respect this, these spiders, like mm. not to kill or squash or you know use um, pesticides, just to sort of be wary of these spiders. L look at your surroundings; they could get into your boots. Um, again, uh, in your mailbox. Mailbox is really interesting when you look in the mailbox. Is anything in there? Yeah. No, we're um, really good because they do get black widows, which I again spoke about. They have that connection to the false widow, but again, much more lethal than the mm. false widow we have here. I think that's a really interesting piece of uh, messaging you had there about respecting the spiders, yeah. not fearing them, um, because they mean us no, no harm intentionally. Well, thanks uh, very much, Ben, for no, no clearing problem. up some of those uh, misconceptions. So, folks, if you've uh, watched any of our previous episodes of NHM Live, you'll know that we have a whole range of very strange specimens tucked away behind the scenes. And we've got one of them that we're going to show you now, our mystery specimen this month. We'll show it to you. Maybe uh, tell us in the comments what you think it might be. So there it was. Any ideas what it might be? Put your suggestions in the comments and we'll uh, reveal later on what the answer is. 
Now, recently in the UK, it was Guy Fawkes Night, or Bonfire Night, where we traditionally set off lots of fireworks. But if you were living in the east end of London, along the River Thames, you might have received a message that the fireworks were cancelled this year. Why was that? Well, there's been a new visitor in the river that doesn't like the sound of fireworks. The River Thames was recently visited by a beluga whale, not something you'd normally expect to find there. But science communicator Eddie Johnson was speaking to Alan Coombs to find out a little bit more about this whale that's lost its way. So, Alan, everybody's talking about Benny the Beluga down in Gravesend. Is it common to see whales in this part of the UK? For some species, it's quite common. So, for example, harbour porpoises or common dolphins, we sometimes see them swimming up the Thames. But for a beluga like Benny or a northern bottlenose whale like we have here, it's not that common at all. Now, this is kind of a great example. Back in 2006, unfortunately, this northern bottlenose whale did swim up the River Thames. What exactly happened there? So we think she was probably lost or disorientated uh, and that she had swum down into the North Sea and then eventually gone up the River Thames looking for food. Um, and these animals uh, usually swim in really deep water looking for their prey source and it's likely that she died from dehydration or starvation. Luckily, we've actually got the bones in the collection here. Is there anything we can learn by studying these? Oh, we can learn loads. Uh, so we can learn why an animal died, perhaps uh, the illness it was suffering from. We know that she had kidney problems from the autopsy of her body. Uh, we can also find out the species, the age and the sex as well as loads of other things. So we're able to discover a lot. Looking into whales, do we have any great understanding of why they are actually stranding? That's a big question <laughs> and unfortunately we don't know the answer. It's likely that they're stranding for lots of different reasons and that different species strand for different reasons as well. Uh, these can be anything from bycatch, so being caught in fishing nets that humans leave out in the ocean. It can be changes in sea temperature from climate change. This can affect distribution of prey. Uh, then the animals follow that prey. They become starved or dehydrated or lost. Uh, um, they can become stranded because of storms. There's loads of different possible reasons. So there's still a lot of research to really be done there. Uh, one of the final things, if anybody finds a whale stranded on a beach around the UK, what would you say is the best course of action for them? So the best thing is to leave it alone. They can get really stressed if there's a large group of people around them. And the best thing we can do is call in the experts. So the Natural History Museum has a strandings team, the Cetacean Stranding Investigations Program. They specialise in looking after whales and dolphins that have stranded. And also local wildlife trusts can help out as well. Oh, fantastic. Well, Ellen, thank you so much for talking to us about whale strandings. Thank you. Oh, fascinating story there with Benny the Beluga Whale and Ellen who you just saw in the film there is joining me here in the studio. Thanks very much Ellen for coming along. And uh, you mentioned in the clip there, uh, you were actually standing next to another whale specimen, the Thames whale that got stranded in 2006. So it's not the first time that a whale has actually come up, uh, up the river. Is this uh, stranding of cetaceans a common thing that happens to cetaceans around the world? Um, it is fairly common actually um, and I've mostly been looking at cetaceans that strand around the UK and Ireland and we actually have a, a data set of over 20,000 records of uh, about 28 different species that strand around the UK so it is, it is actually fairly common, it's mm. more common for some species than others it's usually the more social species that tend to strand all together so in a mass stranding so we tend to see those a bit more regularly in the data set. Now, it's interesting that with uh, the case of the beluga whale, Benny, that's come into Thames, he's not sort of stranded in the sense he's not lying on a beach or anything. He is swimming around. And is he actually stranded or is he just kind of enjoying some time out in the Thames and feeding on the, on the fish in the river? Yeah, so we define a stranding as uh, when a cetacean, so a whale, dolphin or porpoise, uh, beaches on a sandy shore or a rocky shore. Uh, so there's no water around the animal usually. And obviously this is bad news for a, a whale or dolphin. Uh, Benny at the moment, uh, so we don't know if he's male or female, but um, he or she seems to be fine. Um, they've got a, a fairly good layer of blubber or fat around the body. So they're in pretty good condition. Uh, and Benny seems to be feeding as well, which is really important because uh, whales actually get their water from the food they eat, uh, so Benny's not starving or dehydrated and it seems to be fairly happy. He seems fairly content. Yeah. Is there any chance that we might try and give him a helping hand and get him back out to sea or are we just going to leave him be? A, a couple of experts have spoken about the, the thought of, of maybe capturing Benny and taking Benny back to their natural habitat, which is um, up in the Arctic or near Svalbard, so much colder climate. 
um, but we think it would probably stress Benny out um, more than is, is necessary. Um, it's, he, see, he or she seems fairly happy where they mm. are, and so it's probably best to leave them, find their own way back. Excellent. So have you had an opportunity to, to study Benny up close? Have you been out? Uh, I haven't, no. no. Um, I'd love to go uh, down to Gravesend and, and have a look. I know it's, uh, he's getting a lot of uh, crowds of people there and seems to be a, a, a real... Um, exciting experience mm. for the local people yeah so. I've, I've Ben I've <laughs> just wondered if you have you uh, been out that way at all or seen a stranding before uh, not no, <laughs> no. I, I mean I've been, uh, last year I was at Boston's or some humpback whales um, but they weren't stranded they were very much in the middle of the Pacific, <laughs> Pacific I think yeah. excellent yeah. excellent well we've got uh, we've had a few questions coming through um, actually for both of you on uh, on Facebook and uh, Periscope uh, uh, ben, this one is for you, relating back to our spiders we were talking about earlier. Uh, the question is, do conkers work to keep spiders out of your home? <laughs> um, not to my knowledge. Um, I mean, they could potentially come in and actually make a nice little home on the conker. Um, depends on whether it's shelled or not, but I've uh, not read it or seen any evidence that would suggest spiders would not come into your house because of a conker. I mean, unless I suppose you, if you challenge it to a conker fight, um, which I think you'd probably And win. then you're almost guaranteed to win. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but other than that, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh, well, so, yeah, sorry. Unfortunately, conkers don't seem to be the most effective way of keeping spiders out of your house. Um, uh, again, another one. This is from Cecile on Facebook uh, asking, um, she'd like to know how the current infestation uh, that the schools had could be explained. Uh, well, do, do um, we know? Well, it's, again, I uh, that, that word infestation is interesting. Um, we have not seen any pictures from any of the schools that show what this infestation is. And what's interesting is false widow spiders are solitary creatures. They don't like company. The only time they would actually uh, meet each other is actually for mating re um, reasons. Other than that, you would not normally see them but clustered together. So um infestation i'd have to see more about what's going on but from what i know and what scientists know about um the false widow spider they don't group together um mm. outside of when they hatch out of the egg sac and that's about it that's it yeah mm, interesting interesting ellen uh, before uh, we move on um is there any sign uh, that uh, benny the beluga is going to be moving on soon from the thames because i'm sure people in the local area might want to grab a photograph before he moves on do we know how long he's going to stay there absolutely well um it's been in the area for much longer than experts thought um, they thought it'd be maybe a couple of days but it was back in september that benny first appeared and as he seems to be feeding well, uh, seems to be fairly happy, so it doesn't look like he's uh, moving on any time soon. <laughs> Excellent, so something to look out for. Uh, well, thanks very much, uh, Ellen, for sharing that story about Benny, and let's hope uh, there's a happy end and he finds his way home eventually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> The reason that using poison is much more common than venom amongst frogs is because venom is physically injected into a target. And most frogs don't possess an effective instrument to do that, like the fangs on a snake. But Greening's frog is one of two species that we now know inject venom using protruding spines from their head. So when attacked by a would-be predator, the frog will essentially headbutt the assailant. Tiny bones in the upper lip are thrust out of its skin, passing through venom glands, picking up venom, and then delivering it into a would-be predator. This can cause extreme pain and possibly death, so we think it's a pretty effective defense. <laughs> So beware the head-butting frog. Now, if you'd like to find out more uh, stories like that, surprising stories from the world of natural history, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the major social media channels where you can find more of our 60-second surprising science stories. Now, we've got many, many collections behind the scenes. Earlier on, you saw our mystery specimen, but there are many, many more that uh, we have hidden away. And we recently went behind the scenes with science communicator Christina Torrente to actually see what it looks like in some of our storerooms. So let's see what she found out.
Here at the Natural History Museum, we have more than 80 million specimens in store in our collections. But if you come to our galleries, you will see less than 1% of all those specimens. Here we're going to have a look at some bonus specimens from the Osteology collection. These are three of the most complete skulls in the collection for the species Post Primigenius. They are also commonly known as aurochs, and they are the common ancestor to all the domestic cattle. As comparison, I have a skull of a modern cow, and you can see how remarkably Post Primigenius was much larger than the modern cow. These skulls have now been digitized and are available to researchers all over the world through the museum website. Well, wow, fantastic looking room there. Great to get a little glimpse into one of the many storerooms behind the scenes at the museum. And you heard her voice there. That was the voice of Christina. And she joins us now in the studio. Thank you very much, Christina, for oh, coming you. along today. Um, looked great in there. You seem to be surrounded by a whole array of strange specimens. What was it like sort of walking into the room and, and just being surrounded by all of that stuff? It's, it's, it's truly magical, I think. It, it's, it's knowing that there's so much hidden around you. Um, and that you're really privileged to be in there, that you're discovering a part of the museum that otherwise you wouldn't be able to see. Mm. Did it smell a bit funny? Like, there's all <laughs> these like, bones and stuff around you, so I think, is there a sort of musty museum smell in there? Um, there was definitely some sort of smell, um, but it just, it just smelled naturally as if something really old was there, but all in, a, in, a, in an ancient way. But it also smelled like people were looking after those things. Mm. People were actually taking care of the collections behind the scenes. I wouldn't say that the smell was bad. It was more like a, um, a smell of something really important being hidden behind the cabinet. Mm, yeah, <laughs> the cupboards haven't been opened <laughs> yeah, for a while. Yeah, exactly. And is it true that most of the museum's collection is actually in storerooms like that rather than in the public galleries? So even if someone came around and went to every gallery in the museum, they would only have seen a, a fraction of what we have. Yeah, that's true. So that's something that um, I discovered when I started working here that well, you can see in the galleries is I think it's less than 1% um, and it's incredible because as a tourist, as, as a visitor of the museum, you think, wow, I don't even have time to see the whole of the gallery. So when you learn that there's even about more than 80 million specimens behind this thing, it's just really overwhelming. I don't think my head can get around of how many things is that, it's 80 million specimens. Uh, yeah, and one of the interesting things I noticed in the video, um, the curator you were with, Roberto, uh, po he pointed out this wonderful skull of the auroch uh, that was in the cupboard. But you mentioned they're, they're like an extinct, extinct animal now, mm -hmm. and that that was a fossil. But you were in a room full of all these bones of, of different mammals and things. So I just wondered, why was there a fossil in there? Surely that would be in like, the paleontology rooms. Right, that's, be? yeah, that's what you would expect. Um, and actually, I asked the exact same question to Roberto, and he said that there's a blurry line on who gets what at, at some point. Um, so normally is something that is older than 11,000 years or so, which is the last um, glacial age. Um, that will go into paleontology and the rest they'll get it. Um, but the, the specimens that we were seeing there, they're also m a mix between a fossil and an actual bone. It's on the way to becoming a fossil, but it's not yet. So that's why ah, they're so still it's there. Like almost a fossil, but not quite. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Excellent. Now, obviously a lot of that material, uh, I guess for many of our viewers watching, they, they won't be able to get into the stores to study them mm. themselves. But the museum's actually taking steps to make more of that collection accessible to people all over the world. Is that true? Yeah, that is absolutely true. Um, and that's something that Robert was really keen on pointing out, that they digitise in the collections, which means that they're kind of like scanning everything um, that is in it all slowly they're scanning everything that is in there. They're, for example, they are just scanning uh, press plans or they're like 3D scanning specimens like the one Roberto showed. So scientists from all around the world, but also regular people can have a look at them online. Mm. And you can actually have a look at so much detail um, that then you don't have to come to the museum all the way from uh, the States or um, China to actually have a look at a specimen and then go. Mm. So I think that is really, really cool. Yeah, it's fantastic to see more of it going 
going out there and being accessible Absolutely. to everyone. Um, now, some of the specimens, I wonder, Ellen, have you, have you been able to access that storeroom that Christina was walking around? Surely with your work <laughs> on the, the whales, you've been in there. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things I'm actually working on at the moment is digitising uh, whale skulls. So we, we surface scan the skull um, so that we can get it up online for, for people to look at. And it's one of my favourite things is to spend time in the mm. whale uh, warehouse. In, in there, yeah. Um, it certainly feels like that, yeah. <laughs> I think it smells amazing. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's, it smells like um, goose fat roast potatoes because they're, they're Very bones, good the bones are oily. <laughs> yeah. um, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ben, I guess, obviously, as a s spider specialist, you probably don't spend as much time down there as others. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I've been there uh, one, one, once or twice um, when we had the lead-up to hope being put into the world. I don't know more ball about that for our visitors, uh, but outside of that, not really in the remit of... Uh, Spiders, which are slightly smaller than the specimens we've described either side of me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, thank you very much, everyone, for your questions that you've been sending through. Uh, just got a couple. Uh, I'll just put them to you guys. Uh, chip in if you, if you know the answers. We had one question on Twitter. Uh, how many of the carved Waterhouse building animals and plants are represented by real specimens in the collection? So, uh, <laughs> yes, guess anyone that's visited the museum will see these wonderful carvings of wood on the in the architecture. Are they based on real specimens in the collections? Uh, I, I believe so. Well, there's definitely drawings of them. The designs yeah. of them are there. So I don't know if that counts as a specimen. I think so. Mm. Um, if you uh, up on the upper gallery in the Hinty Hall, actually, there is a display case that actually shows the original blueprints, but she shows you specimens um, that may have been the inspiration for the actual architecture. I think there's some plant specimens up there that um, show you like some of the columns that um, the visitors can see when they come in the museum. Yeah. Mm. So uh, I don't know how many but I'd say a large <laughs> uh, amount of them. Yeah, it would make sense, you know, yeah. drawing inspiration from the collection mm -hmm. itself. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, we've had uh, another question come in uh, on Periscope asking, are the collections open to the general public to visit? So I'm guessing this is referring to the scientific collections as opposed oh. to what's in the galleries. So can the public make an appointment to, to join? Ellen, do you yeah, have um, a Yeah, so you can that? book to go on what's called the Spirit Collection Tour, um, mm -hmm. and it's absolutely fantastic. I did it for my birthday once before I was lucky enough <laughs> to work here. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing because you get to see uh, jars of uh, specimens that Darwin collected. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually got his writing on the label, and it says it's the Beagle Voyage. Um, and so yeah, that's definitely worth it. Yeah. Sure you can book it on the website. Fantastic, excellent. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Christina, for uh, taking us on that behind the scenes tour. Is there any other room you'd like to see in the museum you haven't been to yet? So many. <laughs> I've been working here for like three, four years, and I know there's so much I still need to see. This was my second time in the Astrology Connection, so was, yeah, there's so much to explore in the museum. Brilliant, excellent. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for coming along today and uh, sharing you. your explorations behind the scenes. <laughs> thank you. So there's lots of specimens behind the scenes, but how do we get them there? Where do they come from? Obviously, our scientists have to go out, explore the world and find some of those specimens in the collection. And many of them have stories from the field that they can share with us. And uh, today we're going to hear from one of our scientists and one of his tales from the field. Lots of our scientists get to go on field trips all across the world, from the poles to the tropics. And more often than not, they come back with a story to tell. Sometimes it's a story about a new species discovery. Sometimes it's about a hairy situation they've gotten into. And sometimes they're just plain weird. Welcome to Tales from the Field. One of my favorite stories in the field happened 10 years ago. So I was collecting in the island of Sardinia, and I was working on centipedes, which is what a lot of my research is on. So I was looking for particular species, and it's actually, it is the biggest species of centipede in Europe. So it's about that long in some specimens, about 14 or so centimeters. So this is not going to be it, but I'm going to show you a specimen of a very similar thing that's quite a comparable size. So it's a related species. Anyway, I'm collecting with um, a friend of mine, and a, a guy I work with a lot who works at Harvard. Um, he works on arachnids, and he works on mollusks, and he works on centipedes and such. Anyway, one particular day, it starts snowing because it's March, and um, you know, collecting centipedes in the snow is not very productive. So we decide to go down into a village. So we go into this little mountain village, really quaint place. And my mate says, you know, I think I was in this village three years ago. Uh, he was collecting these little arachnids called mite harvestmen. So these little things that look kind of like really hard-bodied spiders. They kind of walk around and really don't look too bright. Um, when, when they're rambling along. Anyway, we go into the only hotel in this village, and um, you know, we, we say to the guy, we're basically looking for somebody, we say, hi, you know, we're here, is anyone here? And the owner appears, and he takes one look at my friend, and he just goes blank. And we're wondering, you know, what's going on here? And he, and he says to us, he opens his mouth and goes, 
the Spider-Man is back. So he remembered that my mate had stayed in this hotel three years ago, and he was so excited to have the Spider-Man back and just to hear what our stories were, why we were there collecting these funny little animals in the forests, that he invited all his mates, uh, all his family members. We spend an evening in, in uh, basically the, the hotel telling stories, um, basically getting really good um, hospitality from these people. And my favorite character was a rapper. He has to be the only rap artist in Sardinian mountain villages. Uh, he's part of a group um, called Bastardi Sardi, uh, which are Sardinian bastards. Um, anyway, it's a, a really, really nice um, evening out collecting. And um, I have to say the end of the story is we never ended up finding this species. Um, and I hope you know, I can get back sometime and, and hopefully see it alive. So there you go, the tale of a real-life Spider-Man uh, doing some research out in the field. A big thank you there to Greg uh, for sharing his story with us. Now it's the moment you've all been waiting for. We're going to reveal for you that mystery specimen that we showed you at the beginning of the show. But before we do that, uh, I want to go through some of the suggestions that you guys have been sending in. They've been quite varied. Uh, so we've had some suggestions that it was a bat, seaweed, uh, a huge insect, and a wolf. So that's quite a variety. And also a mummified ice man. That's an interesting <laughs> one. And a mummified bear. So really strange. Well, let's go and reveal to you what it is. So let's have a look. Well, there you have it. If you're still not sure what it was, that was a mummified cat. Uh, well done, some of you did manage to get it. It's a strange looking specimen for sure. We didn't want to pick a good one. And there's a very interesting story behind this specimen, actually. It uh, was found uh, underneath Chelsea Hospital in London. Uh, it was buried there in the Victorian era. And it was very common in those days to actually bury animals uh, under construction sites to ward off evil spirits and witches during the construction. I wonder if it worked at all. So there you go, well done if you managed to get that right. Um, so before we finish up, we've had a few questions uh, coming through from you guys uh, on Facebook and Periscope. Um, thank you very much for sending these in. Um, I wonder if uh, Ben or Ellen, you would uh, like to have a go at answering a couple of these. Um, so we've had one from Alison on Facebook. Uh, asking, how often do we change the exhibits and bring the collection stored in the museum out for the public to see? So is this something that, do we, I guess, uh, Ben, you work in the galleries mm. a lot. Do we change the, the displays around a lot for people? We do. It's, um, it's usually the, the smaller ones that change, not the more obvious ones. So everyone would notice if one of the elephants went missing from the uh, whale hall, as we call it. But um, if you head up to that, the mineral gallery, which is in the, uh, just off the um, Hinsey Hall, some of the smaller minerals get changed out quite a bit often and put back in or mm. um, like some of the cat actually some of the cats down the mammal um, corridor get changed out a few times but um, usually those collections come out on more temporary exhibitions uh, more than anything mm. more than anything uh, we see but not so much on the permanence uh, unless it's of significance. And we've got the, the, the treasures gallery, which is where like some of our really extra special specimens yeah. come out. And uh, sometimes, because they're so valuable, we have to take them away, is that, you know, so they don't sort of deteriorate or anything. Yeah, just take them away and make sure they're looked after. Again, conservation efforts put back in. I just also, just pop, uh, popped into mind was our Images of Nature gallery, because we have our yeah. temporary exhibition down there, which is the Explorers. And they get changed, I think it's every uh, three or six mm -hmm. months, and uh, to show the new part of that um, exhibition so that's always one to always keep an eye on because that's always changing fantastic uh, such. Uh, thanks very much and uh, Ellen we've got a question here uh, from someone on Periscope they're asking um, how many cetacean species can be found around the UK that's a fantastic question um, so we have 
One of the best ways to know about which cetaceans we do get around the UK is actually looking at strandings records, um, because this also includes some of the rarer or shyer species that you might not see when you're standing on a boat or the shore. Um, so we think from that we have about 28 species around the UK, um, and this includes some really iconic species such as uh, killer whales. Um, we've actually had some blue whale sightings around the UK. Wow. Um, we've got beluga whale sightings now as well with Benny. Um, so yes, it's around 28, which is fantastic. It's uh, one of the best most diverse cetacean uh, populations uh, in the world actually. That's fantastic because yeah. I think we often hear sort of negative stories about you know the whales are in trouble and the numbers are dropping and stuff. To, so to find out there's a real diversity of species out there that we, we could spot if we were just patient um, is really great. Absolutely yeah head out to the southwest coast of England or head up to the northwest coast of Scotland and you'll likely see some dolphins and porpoises as well. Fantastic, excellent. Well, we've just about run out of time, but I just want to say thank you so much uh, to both of you for uh, joining us today and sharing your, your love of uh, spiders, <laughs> whales, or mummified cats, whatever, whatever folks you vote. And thank you guys very much as well for your questions and uh, comments. It's uh, been great to hear from you. Uh, if you want to see more of us uh, on uh, Facebook, do follow us, give us a like, share, share uh, these videos with your friends, encourage them to join, and uh, we'll see you next month for another episode of NHM Live. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.